What is up everyone? I am Dr. N and this is the Health Hub. Welcome back to my channel. If it's your first time here, make sure you like, you comment, subscribe. If it's your second time, welcome back. Welcome back. Make sure you like this video. Give it a thumbs up. Do comment down in the section down below um, on how on what your thoughts are about the video in general. So basically today I'll be giving you just an approach to an OSCE or rather the things you expect when you're having any oral examinations or any presentations and you might be in varsity. So basically this video is mainly for people who are in university or I guess this goes straight up up until when you're actually working because you have to do presentations are literally the crux of medicine basically. Personally myself I have gone through a bunch besides having gone through a bunch <laughs> in my lifetime I have also um, assisted in some assessments for some medical students while I've been a medical officer um, at the hospital where I'm currently working for Walter Cecil University students or medical students who are rotating in our hospital. So I, I, I know a bit of thing or two, you know, you know, give me give me credit where it's due. Let us start with um, the top five things to look out for when preparing for an OSCE or the top five things to do rather when you are, you know, preparing for an OSCE. If you want to know, stay tuned, watch till the end. Um, so that you, you become an A-plus student when it comes to asking things um, and also I hope this opens your view and your whole, changes your whole opinion because I know some of us are shy guys, like some of us don't wanna, we don't like talking in public, we don't like like talking to people we don't know um, but I hope this like sort of encourages each and every one of you to actually have the confidence, you know when having to go through an OSCE. Now let us start with number one tip on what to do when you are preparing for an OSCE. It starts while you are still preparing before you even are ready for exam, while you are still studying. Not all of us have, are particularly good with public speaking and um, some of our, some people are actually really shy and don't like having to talk in public. Unfortunately, you know, there's no way about it. You can't avoid OSCE because of, you know, your fear or anxiety of having to speak in public. Instead, you have to literally grow the balls. Like, there's no way in which you can avoid this or public speaking in this career or in the medical field. You'll have to present patients in the future, even when you're already a medical officer. And this practice, however, starts with things like OSCEs, which happens during medical school. So it is important that you um, gain confidence in who you are and what you stand for and in your knowledge. And the thing that's going to make you gain confidence is your knowledge of your work. So you have to make sure in terms of course content that you are literally on top of your game you have to get rid of the imposter syndrome um, and you know power through and understand that God put you where you are for a reason and for a particular purpose you have you belong you actually belong where you are I don't know if it was just me but um, you do get some voices in your head that voices that may tell you that you don't belong to be at the place that you find yourself in or that um, or you might even start comparing yourself with other people who are maybe better speakers, some of your friends who are like good at this thing or even can are more fluent in English and speak bombastic words. <laughs> but it's honestly not about that. The most important thing that you have to take note of is just to practice confidence. And sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. Like tell yourself that you're the best thing out there. <laughs> like sometimes you have to like hype yourself up, have inner confidence, try build your self-esteem regarding, you know, speaking in public. Um, you know, silence all the voices, silence all the noise, tell yourself you're the best thing out there. Um, you are literally your own hype man, so do that. Make sure that you are, you know, prepared to the T. Um, if it helps anyone, personally for me, talking to, you know, the mirror helped me so much, especially with regard, I'm sure people next door <laughs> at Rays probably thought like I was losing my mind. But personally, even with orals when I was still in high school, like, you know, I can cry, but in order for me to gain confidence in how I spoke or speak in front of people, I would literally, you know, do the whole presentation or just talk to the mirror so that I get used to speaking for yourself or explaining your case, you know, simple things, you know. And you also have to also be in the right mental state. I know, you know, as people, we're going through things and um, sometimes a lot of the things can weigh in on you and um, make you feel a certain type of way. But you have to, you know, spiritually and mentally be fit and at the right place for you to to be present during the, the exam and sometimes if you are going through a lot of things it can stress you out but literally you have to silence the noise so that is number one confidence number two is the dress code dress code is just as important I don't care if someone tells you it's what's in your head or whatever but how you dress and how you present yourself to people says a lot to to them about 
how i don't know i don't know personally it says a lot to them that you respect them enough to put in effort in the way that you dress um and and respect that this is an exam situation and um as it, as much as it is an exam exam situation you put some thought in the way that you actually in your appearance basically so it is just as important like it's not a fashion show yes but you know the way that you look says a lot about the respect that you have for the people that you'll be presenting to even in future it says a lot about the respect that you have for the patients that you'll be coming across imagine like let's pretend that you're someone who goes to visit a gp and you walk into their office everything is all over the place you know they're not dressed nicely their shirts are all wrinkled they and like their buttons are not even and what impression does that give you about that person like personally for me how you present yourself says a lot to me about yourself about the respect you have for yourself and your space and your surroundings so it is very important to me personally that your appearance you know plays a role you don't have to be wearing the most expensive clothes just like iron your clothes iron your lab coat also but, no scrubs i don't want no scrub scrub is a guy won't get no love for you will not get marks or the marks that you deserve if you are wearing scrubs wear scrubs everywhere except in an exam situation so hashtag no scrubs no scrubs scrubs are for calls scrubs are for regular work or a day at work Scrubs are not for exam situations, so ditch the scrubs, please, please ditch the scrubs. If you if you go for jeans, make sure that you wear a formal shirt or formal shoes. It's not necessary for you to be super formal as a guy, but also you wanna show you wanna you know show the the examiners you know that you actually take yourself seriously and your patients in the future, that hey I take myself seriously type vibe. So it is important that you address accordingly. So you don't have to wear a tie and a suit. That's just team too much. Um, but you know, it is important that everything has to be like crisp clean, you know, crisp clean. I know some people, you know, smoke and I, uh, you know, might take a shot or two <laughs> guys, if you haven't, if you don't smoke and you're not an alcoholic, not an alcoholic, but if you don't drink much, let me tell you, you are so sensitive to someone who will be next to you or talking to you who did those things prior. So it is important that you try, hold yourself. Like if you really can't, you know, not smoke. You can smoke and like grab a mint. Um, you also don't want to give off. Not that smoking is like not for doctors. I know doctors do smoke. There's doctors who smoke. But I'm just like, you know, I do what you want. It's your life, you know. But also like in that type of situation, that type of environment, just like contain yourself, you know. Yeah. So um, that is that with regard to the guys, with the girls, whatever. Like you can wear a dress. You can wear anything. Nothing above the knee personally. No. Because what if you're sitting down? It's just you don't want to be uncomfortable either. It doesn't work. It's that's not the place or the time, you know? If you have assets like a cleavage, like button up your shirt to the end, like personally, cause that's not the type of attention you're trying to draw to yourself. You're literally there for academic purposes. So literally draw that. If you wear a pencil skirt and you have like big hips or whatnot, like just cover up. I know we're not trying to push the notion of don't, don't, yeah, I'm feminist, whatever. But the reality of the situation is that you might have guy examiners. You don't want this the environment to just be uncomfortable. So it is important that you dress accordingly. You don't have to wear heels. You can wear nothing like a kitten heel. You don't want to look like you're going to like the club or, or anything, you know, not too much makeup also. You don't want to look too much. You just want to... I just want to look like a decent human being if you get what I mean. And um, moving on to number three, and that is the crux of why we are here. So with regard to actually the preparation, right? So that is that's where we're getting to the meat, you know. So with regard to the preparation, the most important thing that you have to do. I feel like med school became easier to me when I started, you know, communicating with other people, and that it, and that's what you have to do. Basically, you have to talk to other people who've done this before, who've walked the road, either people who have you know, from a previous year, have had certain or specific cases in their OSCEs or people who have rotated in that specific block that you want information on or that you're going through yourself. So it is very important that you ask them because literally, guys, they ask the same thing. It's mainly less than like 10 topics at most. Um, you can find sitting down stations where they ask you to like interpret things and write down things and blah, blah, blah. But that you will have studied for, um, for your written exam anyways. So it is important that you ask people you know, what did you get when you did that, you know, OPS and gynae exam? What did you get in your internal medicine exam? And this helps create a whole, like you can do it even like among each other, you know, during the year or with the previous years where people will just maybe after an exam, write down the cases that they got um, so that you're able to compile the whole thing, you know, because they asked literally the same things. 
common things occur commonly often ask you write it down write down what you got asked write down what was you know deemed as important you know so that you're able to help other people in other groups as well um also don't let this also narrow your vision in terms of the things that you actually study for make sure you also broaden your knowledge you will have studied for everything anyways during for your written so so yeah that is that with with regard to to preparation after that after you have your main topics that are commonly asked written down maybe let's say there's 10 for internal medicine let's say there's 10 for obs and gyne yeah? so after doing that you have to actually so personally for me what made things easier is to create like mind maps so you can do tables um, it differs based on you know the types of the type of a learner that you are. So personally, for me, mind maps were better were better than tables because tables sometimes sometimes I couldn't like when I try to remember I wouldn't remember tables. But the best believe mind maps would make it so much easier. So you will say maybe cervical CA for example, yeah. And then after having cervical CA, then you have to branch out history. Well, how do they typically present? What do they come in complaining of? You know. So you have to have things like you know, main complaint, how they typically present. Um, and then move on to, you know, risk factors. And risk factors you find out mainly from past medical history. Um, you also find out risk factors from social history. Does smoking or alcohol affect, affect this, you know, how common this disorder occurs? The other risk factors that you're able to pick up on history is things like surgical history. For example, you know, a bowel obstruction. Um, in this, in terms of the surgical cases, has this person had a laparotomy before? You find that they had a gunshot wound before, therefore that's why they're more predisposed to having maybe bowel obstruction. So, so those are the things that you have to sort of um, look out for in terms of history. Then you move on to a branch, another branch, examination. How do they present typically on examination? You know, the abdomen, and you go to IPPA, like you have to be thorough as a student, you can't cut corners. You go, inspection, what do you see? Palpation, what do you see? Percussion, what do you see? Auscultation, what do you see? Basically, you know, tallies and O'Connor. So this is just an example of the things that I used to do as a student. Most of the information is from tallies and O'Connor. I just literally did this to try to compress the information so that I better remember it. And I did. So with every system, I literally wrote down things to look out for. Um, I even um, had some mnemonics to try to make sure that I remembered the information better. Um, obviously, IPPA, um, so to make sure that I don't miss anything. So you can also do something similar because I know tallies can be daunting and it's like a textbook and textbook are just hard to remember. So basically this helped a lot, especially in um, in the earlier years, third and fourth year. And however, in sixth year, they need more, more thought <laughs> that goes into it. Whereas in third and fourth year, most of the things that they want to see, they want to see that you know Leopold's maneuvers. They want to see if you know how to examine a pregnant lady, if you know the different steps of labor and etc. So yeah. Um, also, while preparing, you're also looking at things like investigations what type of investigations are done for this particular condition like for example there's also gold standard um gold standard what's it investigations that are used to confirm a specific pathology so you have to also be on top of your game with regard to that while you are still studying you are until you're researching this specific condition you're researching ca cervix right so you have to know okay what is you know you, you know the examination, the things that you're likely to find on examination, right? You're likely to find a mass, you're likely to find this. Do, are you looking, you're thinking, is it something that's cancerous or infective? Is it likely to metastasize or not? Are you looking for, you know, um, areas in which this, this, this cancer can metastasize? So that already gives you the impression or that opens your mind up that you actually have to look for a liver. What if it metastasizes? You have to look for regional metastasis. You have to look for regional lymph nodes. I don't know, guys, that's... I don't know how easy, like it's easy, it's, it's really easy, like I can't, I can't say, like I can't go in any deeper, you know, very easy, you have to be thinking, thinking with a capital T, you know, um, and then after when you're done with the whole examination, right, while you are still preparing, until you're still at home with your paper, you're still writing down, then you go to investigations, how is this thing confirmed, what are the, you know, what, what do you have to do to confirm, you know, do you do pap smear? Do you do biopsy? Do you do this? Do you do that? How do you stage it now? You know, this is A plus. Now we're going to A plus things. Like, how do you stage it? 
you know, the different staging. You write the staging, don't don't pound on the side until you're trying to get an A. You write a staging, don't don't pound on the side. Now you have the staging on the side. What are the specific treatment? Like how do you how is it treated? Now we're on sixth year. Now we're on fifth year, final year things. Like how do you treat it? Is this done? When do you do this? Oh, it's treated based on the staging. So based on the staging, you already know what needs to be done, you know. Um, is this patient treated as outpatient or inpatient, you know? You have to know those things. And unfortunately, the, the, the exposure, most of the exposure that you get, that's why fifth and sixth years spend majority of their times, whichever uni university you will have gone to, majority of fifth year, sixth year, is five days in hospital, one day in lectures and, and tutorials, you know? Because these things, you might not even, like you find that majority of these things you will have picked up in the wards and the medical officers are, the medical officers and the interns are your resources, you ask them because they will tell you exactly what is done. So you have to be in the wards, ask them what is done. When they say something, go research, look it up, what is this, what is this, what is this, you know? So, so we are still there at the preparation where you are doing you are, you know, going through, you know, investigations to do things you are likely to pick up. Also, teach yourself to know how to interpret bloods, like the normal ranges. These are the things they ask fifth and sixth year students, guys. Right? Like, you have to know the normal HP for a woman and a man. You have to know the normal platelet count. You know, you have to know what is done with it when it's low, when it's this, when it's high, what it means, you know. So, so those are the things that you can learn once off because they will be, they will sort of be like general for every block that you'll have to go through. You have to sort of know how to interpret the results because you'll say, um, I would like to do a an UNE. And next thing they like work it out like months. Then you have to actually be like, okay, I am interpreting the UNE of this person. I'm making sure that this is the right patient. Um, the name, the surname is the right patient and the stickers match to make sure that it's the right patient. Also, in, after, I, uh, after confirming identity, we are moving on to the actual values. You are seeing that this is this number. The sodium is 100 and... 35 it is normal because the normal range is between 135 to 145 do you know what i mean so also you have to show that like guys like being an a plus student is, is now that i think about it i'm just like that is the like even me myself and i like there's times i'm just like oh my goodness oh my fucking goodness like i could have this shit is easy like it is logical until we still prepare it in your mind map right um so after having gone through um the possible investigations and you know the lab things you're going through the lab things things that you're likely to pick up what is the low square mass uh, intraepithelial lesion how is it treated don't don't yeah well, so we textbook you're already going through the things that they're going to be asking right in terms of the specifics right and then after that um doing investigations and treatment of the patients be it either surgical when they say how you're going to treat it obviously you have to break it down and be systematic in the way that you do things uh, management is it's um you know you know surgical or pharmacological you know so so those are the things that i guess you have to you know, have prepared for and written down you know before you get to it so that you have your whole paper sheet per topic yeah well because you're only doing one block so what's what's the most they can ask miscarriages you know we gain um you know tb pulmonary tb you know that goes with hiv so you have to know the who staging I can't, I can't mention everything, but I'm just trying to give you an idea that you can actually, actually get an A in OSCEs, literally. This is how you get an A in OSCE, you know. Then after that, um, while you are drawing your mind map, ne? then you draw a section. Until we did, we did history or typical presentation history examination. We did investigations um, and then we did management, broke down the management to surgical, pharmacological. So with every condition, there's things that are highlights that are specific to that particular condition. So those are the things that you have to sort of like remember um, and also be like, okay, this is this. With this, you know, this. With a pulmonary embolism, they will likely ask you, how is the typical ECG of someone who has a PE? So you have to know those things. So these are the... I call them red flags, but you also can put them, you know, on that mind map, right? Red flags, because those are the specifics with regards to that specific condition. And basically, after you have your mind maps for that block and you have created them, the last thing that you have to look at um, with regard to that you have to put into your mind map is differentials. So what are the differentials for this condition? Obviously, you look at things like location, you know? That's how you form differentials. I promise you, even if... 
even if you don't know whatever that condition may be, maybe they ask you about Burhavis syndrome, you know, that's what the patient has. But typically the patient is an upper GI bleed, right? So you might not even know the specifics about the condition, but you know upper GI bleeds and you know, you know, the, the differentials for upper GI bleed. So, so those are the things that you'll have to rattle out. So you just have to compartmentalize everything so that you're able to remember it specifically, right? So if, for example, we see a cervix, they'll have maybe PV bleeding. So what are the differentials of PV bleeding, right? So then that's when you also break it down, also have an approach. So they basically, when they're asking for differentials, this is key. I didn't know this when I was in medical school. Like, I, I did not know this, maybe until like sixth year. Maybe until sixth year, I did not know this. And I just, I just like kick myself because it's the easiest thing. So when someone asks you for differentials, they basically, they basically asking you for an approach to something. Yeah, well, what are the different pathologies that can cause a similar presentation? As a new patient, yeah. that's how you break it down, based on how you would have studied that particular condition. So this can be the same or different for everyone. Um, one person can say, okay, in terms of my differentials, I will, I would, you know, I would break it down into infective causes that affect the lung, and these are the infective causes. It could be, you know, um, you know, uh, fungal pneumonia, and then in terms of congenital, when it comes to pediatrics, congenital causes of lung pathologies, um, especially when you're dealing with a pediatric population, neoplastic conditions, you know, that can affect the lung, um, you know, things like that. You have to just ha look at it systematically. So now you have your pamphlets. Now you are rattling out your things in front of your mirror. It's the night before. You are just wrapping, 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 wrapping. The next day, you put on your clothes because I already told you how to dress nicely, right? And then after putting on your nice clothes, you put on that confidence, two sprays of that cologne, not 10, thank you, um, and um, iron your lab coat if you have to, um, and then you're on the road. Make sure you have your name tag because they have to be able to identify you or your student card or whatever. Okay, then okay, when you're walking in into the examination, confidence, you can do it. You already won the battle. If you tell yourself you can do it, it's already in your mind that you've succeeded and you will succeed, right? So you have to have that confidence. Make sure you look them in the eye, greet them, hi, smile. I'm, you know, and and I will be presenting patient to this. But sometimes normally they have a patient, um, so they normally, you know, have you read out for two minutes, you know, the story, and they just say in the next station you are gonna be presenting an X-ray, yeah, well. Then that's where you start confidently greeting today, loud, audible, you know, you have to project so that they're not like, what, what, what did you say? No, we didn't hear. Uh, I didn't hear you say, no, no, we're not looking for us. The ascents who didn't hear. <laughs> we are not here for didn't hear. We are here for, you know, fluent, you know, audible, you know, projecting type voice, you know, where everything is just proper and clear. And the thing is, when you are confident, then you're able to, to say what you want to say and and say it clearly, yeah, well, So you have to be that, like I'm presenting patients with this and this patient, I'm checking the date, it's done at the proper date and this. This is a chest x-ray um, view. Obviously, you have your own system on how to present you know, e, e images and all that. So you have, you do it the way that you would normally do it and you are taught how to do that. The last thing that will happen after you've presented and done everything, you know, it will be A plus questions. And it's in those A plus questions where they'll be asking you um, those red flags. So that's where they'll be asking you those red flags. Remember I told you that there's, there's highlights for every condition. So that's when they'll be asking you those things. And those things are normally like A plus things. Those are 75, 80, 80%, 85% type questions. The last important thing that you have to take note of is to not question yourself during an exam. Don't question your knowledge. It's not the time to question. It's not the time to be saying, ish, but, you know, hey, no. At that point in time, you have to either know it or you don't, you know. Um, so you can't be questioning. You have to say, this is this and this is that, you know. Because sometimes examiners, when they see that you're not really confident, they're like, but is it? 
and then now we're what going but I know the thing, but you'll question things that you know. So you have to stand your ground. Number five, stand your ground. Say what you know. Just like that, you know. Don't let don't let the questioning also make you back down. Also don't let the fact that they might, you know, be tired and not give you feedback energy. Go on. Go on like energy back. You you know, some people during examinations I found that they want to be given feedback during and that cannot happen all the time and that's not particularly something that's right to do. You're supposed to know your work to the point of you not needing that feedback. So you have to have to have to um, you have to be confident in your work and what you know so that you don't wait for the feedback to come to you <laughs> or for, for them to feedback in order for you to, to be like, okay, yeah, I know I'm on the right track. Don't, don't do that. That is, that is the biggest mistake you can ever do and that can derail you, especially if you get someone who, who doesn't care, who won't even steer you in the right direction. Ah, you just literally drive all the way down the wrong street and it, there's no returning. There's no returning from that. So yeah, um, I hope this was helpful. Um, I hope you find this beneficial. I don't go through specifics, but you can, I'm sure there's like a lot of medical channels for that. This was just a guide on the things to look out for, how to prepare for it, on how to, how to be mentally when you're having to go through a, a presentation or like a, an OSCE or an oral examination, right? So yeah, if you enjoyed it, make sure you like, you comment, you subscribe. If you have any, any comments, make sure you also link them down below. I'll be sure to answer any of your comments. Um, and yeah, thanks for watching. I'll catch you on my next video. Bye.